Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we're continuing on the topic of heaven, and this is the twelfth episode. Uh, if you haven't seen the previous eleven episodes, they're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. And the way we're approaching this is we're going through this book by Randy Alcorn titled Heaven. And as we go through the book together, we're discussing what Randy says about heaven and what he says the scriptures tell us about heaven. So it's been very interesting, and uh, we're having a good time doing it. So go back and watch those previous episodes. It'll be very helpful to you. But first, let's before we start the show, let's uh, introduce the panelists. We'll start with Brother Austin. Thanks, Brother Luke. How's everybody doing? My name is Austin. My uh, channel's name is Austin Bell. I run an online ministry called Christ Ministries, and I'm uh, glad to be here for this session. Okay. Uh, Austin, glad you could make it. Okay. And Brother Eric. Hey, guys. I uh, hope everybody's doing well tonight. Uh, my YouTube channel is Jesus Knight, like K-N-I-G-H-T 72 at, uh, uh, on YouTube. Um, looking forward to continuing this uh, really great conversation, this spirit, uh, really spiritual uplifting conversation is about our future. Okay, thank you, Eric. And next we got Brother Jackson. Hello, everyone. My name is Jackson, and my YouTube channel is Mecha Wing Zero. That's the word zero, not the number zero. And I am excited to talk about heaven, especially now because school is starting up and things are, are going are gonna to start to stress me out pretty quick here. And it's good to keep your eyes on the long, long term rather than the short, long term, even though the short, long term is somewhat important. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we got Brother Mike. Hello, my name is uh, Mike. My channel name is Mike Green, G-R-N, simple like that. I'm another defender of biblical salvation and a promoter of uh, sowing God's word to people. You can also contact me at my email, thisplanetisdoomed, at gmail.com. Yes, okay. Thank you, Brother Mike. Since I'm going to respond to what you just said about sowing the word here, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if everybody saw the last two little short videos I made about uh, elevator evangelism and uh, drive-by shoutings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hope you guys will try that stuff. It's really a lot of fun doing it. And, and well, it's, you saw Austin and I's comment on that. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. He wants to do it, and you want to drive him around to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea. <laughs> One of the things about those partic two particular methods is that uh, for someone who may not have the, the confidence to, to go out and on a corner where a bunch of people are into a park where there's a lot of people and stand on a soapbox and preach, you know, this is something that you can feel where, okay, I'm at a safe distance, I'm in a car, I can always drive away, I'll just say a few words to them and then leave, you know, or <laughs> talk in the elevator. So, um, yeah, I think uh, if you try that, I want to get the reports back from you how, how it went, so please do that. Okay, we're we going to start. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, we got quite a bit of snow right here, so I'd have to make it a real quick drive-by shouting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're on, we're on chapter 13. And Eric, if you're following along here, you're going to notice that I'm, I'm skipping quite a bit. of Some of these pages I skip entirely because I feel it's kind of redundant of what we've covered already. So yeah, I'm I agree. Moving up, I'm moving up to page 130. Uh, the, by the way, the, the title of this particular chapter is, uh, Randy Alcorn asked the question, how far-reaching is the resurrection? Okay, um, reforming our vocabulary to fit the resurrection. A radio preacher speaking about a Christian woman whose Christian husband had died said, quote, little did she know that when she hugged her husband that morning, she would never hug him again." Unquote. Though the preacher's words were well-intentioned, they were not true. He could have said, quote, she'd never again her hug, hug her husband in this life, unquote. or better, 
uh, she she would have not been able to hug her husband again until the next world, uh, unquote. Because of the coming resurrection of the dead, we will be able to hug each other again on the new earth. Uh, the point he's going to make here in this section, I find it just very interesting, and that is the kind of terminology that we've used. Uh, matter of fact, I've been very guilty of this myself, and I'm, I'm going to make a real effort to... to use the correct terminology uh, when I'm talking about heaven and the, and the afterlife, after this life is over. So um, he's, he's bringing up some interesting uh, terminology that we're going to have to consider here. Uh, what do you think of what, the point he just made about how the woman, she said that's the last, he said that's the last time that they'll ever hug each other. You know, you know it's funny. Um, as I go down this this road in my, in my walk with Christ, and you know, I grow and continue to grow, uh, I'm noticing more and more words or phrases that I used to kind of take for granted, and I kind of just would blurt them out, and I start to hear them as they're coming out now, and then stop and change them, and things sim very similar to this, which recently have come out in conversations, and it's and that's that's another thing that studying the Word of God does. It kind of it it, it you, the Holy Spirit will come to you in his moments be like, oh, you know what, I can't say that. I need to say this. I need to correct that statement because that's not true. It happens so much more in life now that, you know, that I really am you know, into my faith. And uh, it's just funny. That's, that's, uh, that's not the first time I've heard something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, vocabulary and communicating. Obviously, uh, if there's somebody out there watching this and you want to start telling people about Jesus, you know, I, I want you to do it as long as you're telling them that salvation is a free gift and we, don't, we can't earn it. We need to receive it as a gift by putting our faith in Jesus. Now, the, the, the words you use, the terminology and all that, uh, you know, you'll get better as time goes on and you study with experience, you'll improve. But the main thing is, if you have the basic message right, get busy doing it. Get busy talking to people right. about it. You don't have to have uh, the... But I think over time, we've all learned that some of the words that are commonly used and phrases uh, are being used incorrectly. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So he says, someone might say, quote, uh, we all know what the preacher meant, unquote, but I'm not so sure we really do or that he really did. I'm not trying to be picky, but we need to carefully reform our vocabulary to express what's actually true. If we don't, we will ultimately fail to think biblically and continue to embrace predominant stereotypes of heaven. Uh, here's another example. I quote, that's the last time I'll ever see him in his body, that of his son who died. No, because they were both Christians. They will see each other, each other again in their resurrection bodies. So he's given us two quick examples to make this point. And uh, I think that you know we'll probably be more sensitive when we hear people speak and maybe more sensitive about the way we express it. By the way, don't feel uh, you need to uh, wait to be called upon if you if you want to interject anything anytime. Uh, then he says, uh, quote, I'll never see my daughter again on this earth, unquote. But if she is a believer, and you are, then the statement is wrong. You will see her again on this earth. You and she will be transformed, and the earth will be transformed, but it will still really be you and your daughter on an earth that really is the same earth. Yeah. So, you know, there's three examples of uh, speaking incorrectly about, uh, you know, eternity, you know, the condition of, of everything in eternity. He says, we do not just say that we believe. We end up believing what we say. Let me repeat that. We do not just say what we believe. We end up believing what we say. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, probably a, a psychological phenomenon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, this part I underlined, so maybe this is important. I said, that's why I propose that we should consciously correct our vocabulary so it conforms to revealed biblical truth. Yeah, that's the point I made Sounds earlier. Like 
Yeah, deprogramming. I mean, I know, uh, not even relating to heaven and eternity, you know, I've already spoken out against incorrectly using the words uh, like the word gospel and the word repent. Uh, and right. uh, um, there, there, there's, there's numerous words that I've already encountered in, on the subject of salvation that, uh, that people are commonly misusing the words and don't understand uh, what, how, what they're doing. Yeah, really yeah t totally. Like, like here, an example is the expression, I gave my life to Christ for salvation, people will say. Yeah. Most of the, there are a few of those people who are saved that are just using sloppy language that they've heard re re repeated, but a lot of those people are trusting in them actually giving up their life or control their life to get saved, which is yeah. always, you, you, you never know. Every time somebody says, I gave my life to Christ for salvation, I have to wonder what the person actually believes, if that makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah very good point. And I, I think that it would be very wise every time we encounter someone who says something that we know is uh, phrased incorrectly, that we, we should probably give them a, a litmus test very quickly. You know, I, a diagnostic question that I've always liked is, on, on what basis uh, are you going to have eternal life in heaven? On what basis, on what grounds? And, and let them plead their case to you and say, well, on the grounds of Jesus is my Savior. I'm trusting him. Well, okay, that's good enough for me then. And then we can talk about these other things that they're using bad language. Uh, but if if I ask them that question, they say, well, the basis I'm going to heaven is because I've uh, given my life to Jesus. <laughs> you know, I said, well, that's what I thought you just said. But that's not how you get saved. Yeah, you know what? I, I guess I'll... Um... I'll use this as an opportunity for as a plug, I guess, not for me, not for me, but for another YouTuber we talk about sometimes. Jack Smack seventy mm seven -hmm. has an, has a video called Evil Testimonies, and I highly recommend everyone watch that because we've got to be really careful when we're telling people how we got saved and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's some that's some applause for Brother Jack Smack. So. Anybody watching this, if you go to his channel, uh, uh, you, there, there is no stronger defender of the faith on YouTube that I've found than, than Brother Jack Smack. Okay. Um, uh, it's hard for us to think accurately about the new earth because we're so accustomed to speaking of heaven as the opposite of earth. It may be difficult to retrain ourselves, but we should do it. We must teach ourselves to embrace the principle of continuity of people and the earth in the coming resurrection that Scripture teaches. You know, that, you know what, that, what that brings to mind that you just read is, there's a song, Heaven is a Place on Earth. It was kind of a popular hit song. And it seems like if you replaced it with, is a state rather than place, that might actually kind of be accurate according to Randy Alcorn. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Heaven is a state on earth, or whatever. Or it's an eventuality, at least. Yeah. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. that, that's a state, just like the butterfly. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you remember, uh, you remember quite a few episodes ago, we were talking about the, 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 the misunderstanding that people think heaven is just a state of existence, but it's not a truly a place of existence. Right. right. So now you flipped it around and said, <laughs> said well, uh, it is, it, is a, it is a place on earth, but, but the state of heaven, the, 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 the yeah. fact that it's really heaven, is right here on earth. Right. The state, the state has to do with what, what the environment is in, not what we're in. We're just in a place. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing how backwards the, the, these things get in people's minds and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, he says, because ethereal notions of heaven have largely gone unchallenged, we often think of heaven as less real and less substantial than life here and now. Hence, we don't think of heaven as a place where people will hug, and certainly not in the, these bodies. But in heaven, we, don't, we won't be shadow people living in shadow lands, to borrow C.S. Lewis's imagery, Instead, we'll be fully alive and fully phys physical in a fully physical universe. In one sense, we've never seen our friend's body as truly as we will see it in the eternal heaven. We've never been hugged um, here as meaningfully as we'll be hugged there. And we've never known this earth to be all that we will then know it to be. 
Jesus Christ died to secure our for us a resurrected life on a resurrected earth. Let's be careful to speak of it in terms that deliver us from our misconceptions and do justice to the greatness of Christ's redemptive work. Uh, I've been catching myself lately trying to be more conscious of this and, and I'm trying to come up with an idea of, of the best way of expressing it. In other words, uh, I've always asked the person, do you want to go to heaven when you die? This is one of the questions I've asked people you know, uh, in my ministry. Uh, have you heard the good news? Do you want to receive the free gift of eternal life? Do you want to go to heaven when you die? And I'm wondering if I am asking them, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Die needs to be changed. Uh, do you maybe do you want to have eternal life in, in uh, paradise, a paradise on earth forever, something like that? I don't know. I'm going to have to come up with some kind of terminology that I think is more correct, so I'm not uh, contributing to the misconception about heaven being some ethereal other dimension. That seems to be a common misconception that it's some, like, like it's interesting the comment you made about shadow people, because people generally have accepted it's like some willow of the wisp, so to speak. Uh, uh, yeah, imaginary, I don't want, want to say that, but that's kind of what the, what's been culturally accepted, that it's not a real physical place where there will be real physical interactions. Mm -hmm. Yes, brother, I know you just joined this uh, hangout and this topic, so you haven't been with us for like uh, 20, you you were there for the last hour, you missed the first 21 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what that means is that uh, th this whole point of this um, concept of some spiritual realm versus a physical realm, uh, uh, physical bodies on the physical earth, in eternity, this is we've gone into great, great depth in in, in uh, 21 hours of talking about this. Uh, but you're right, uh, and that's the point we've made: is that very few people in the church, first of all, understand it, and secondly, if they do understand it, they don't speak correctly about it. So, uh, any any ideas off the top of your head how I could possibly improve my language when I ask someone, "Do you want to go to heaven when you die?" Uh, I know one thing, though, uh, kind of along this line. I just never like the phrase um, when you when you first start out. Do you know where you do you know where you're going when you die? I never did like that because uh, I don't know. It just kind of puts a gloom on things, you know. You don't necessarily have to say, well, you know, you're gonna die and then give them the good news. You can just give them the good news and then tell them, yeah, well, because you've sinned, you're gonna die. But I never really liked just coming right out of the boat and say, hey, do you know where you're going when you die? Because it kind of puts an eerie tone on the conversation. You know, you already kind of start it in a gloomy state, and you kind of got to jump start it when the good news can just come out and boom, you already got things going. Then you just keep going, going with that. Then you can explain death after the good news. But I, I don't know. I don't really want to hit him with the death and then hit the good news. I like to maybe go with the good news, then tell them why they need the savior because they're going to die. But at least I give them the good news so then they can fall back on that later in the conversation. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, there are people that, that want to make the message nothing but positive, uh, and I've I, I've spoken um, in in my uh, preaching many times. I've gone into great detail about death and that it's inevitable, and that uh, we were that from the day we're born, we're born with this death sentence, and we know that some point in the future yeah, we're we're doomed you know to die. Pajamas. I bought I bought the uh, yeah, I, um, thing for the DVD player thing. I bought. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Eric. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, yeah, I, I, um, I gotta tell you, I, I agree with Austin. I think Austin's got the right idea. I mean, it's, it's, we, we tend to, we tend to bring things up in that, in that way because we are so comfortable with death. I mean, like you mentioned earlier, you said one of the things that we talk about as Christians, people think we're kind of nutty. You know, it's like when we talk about death, people say, well, you know, how do you feel about death? I say, well, I have no problem with death. I'm ready to go anytime the Lord wants to take me because I know I'm going to be in a better, much better place with him. And that's that's actually where I'm supposed to be. It's where I want to be, where my heart is. And um, people kind of look at us and think we're, we're crazy with that. The world doesn't see things that way. And I see where Austin's coming from. They hear death and they – spiritually I believe they inside they know their destruction they know their they know their state they know what state they're in and it haunts them and they hate it and they and by talking about it it brings them down 
And, but so and so they don't, and it's one of those things why they don't want to have death as part of the conversation. So I think it's a great thing that you've brought up here is like a way to say things as far as how to put it in such a way where people who would be very touchy about death might not welcome the death conversation. You know what I mean? It, it's um. We we're like I said we're very comfortable with it because we have confidence in Christ and we know his in, where he's taking us you know we know where we're going when we die. Yeah. Um, here's here here's um I I think it's really important here we think about considering the audience if that makes sense because here here's I guess this this is my philosophy for whatever two cent whatever it's worth is unfortunately we have a lot of people running around calling themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. Who to quote to quote this one guy from Duluth Bible Church? I just saw the sermon. Are as lost as can be, unfortunately. And if someone's claiming to be a Christian, I don't think the question "Do you know for sure where you're going?" is a is a bad one because that really gets them to think. You know, do I actually know for sure, or am I trusting in? Am I really tr saying I will saying um. I say I believe the Bible. Am I really believing it? And that and the, and that kind of thing. Um, I, I I kind of agree with Austin about the positivity, but instead of, instead of maybe saying, "Do you know where you're going when you die?" Maybe saying, "Has anyone ever showed you how to know for sure from the Bible that you're going to heaven when you die or something?" Mm -hmm. is, uh, well, I, well, that's kind of where I was coming from. I, I was yeah. assuming that Luke's question was directed to, but, to those people who don't have confidence in where they're going. They don't yeah. really, well, they haven't chosen. You know, he's kind yeah, of the, the certainty. The point I'm trying to harp on is the certainty of the gospel is really at the heart of its good news. You know, I, mm -hmm. I saw someone's garbage website one time that said the Bible doesn't offer absolute assurance of salvation, and. That being the case, that makes it really no better than any other religion and everything. Again, it's this uh, mishmash of confusion and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. so I really think harping on the certainty aspect is a good thing. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, I want to issue a caution to everybody. I'm not telling you to uh, uh, not uh, apply this principle that Austin is advising, but I'm just going to tell you, expect some backlash. Because there are going to be people that are saying that you're watering down the message if you don't talk about death and if you don't talk about hell, that this is not a balanced message. Uh, so be prepared for that. Oh, uh, let me let me stop you real quick, Luke. Um, and I'm I'm not saying that. And I don't think that's what Austin was saying. I think Austin was saying we're we're kind of saying this is a point where you're you're broaching a conversation. You're kind you're kind of getting the dialogue started. I don't think you want to roll right into the dialogue. You'll go into that. And discuss okay. it, and that's always a part of it. And 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 you're absolutely correct. So I don't think Austin meant that either. It's not something where you don't discuss hell because that's an inevitability you have to discuss. And you okay. and you, you you of course don't want to water down the gospel. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me ask Austin then if that is um, if I did misunderstand him. Yeah, yeah. Did, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I meant yeah. You had death. Just I I was saying you just don't hit him with the first thing. You know, your first topic is not boom. Oh, you're gonna okay. die. Yeah, I, I, I said you can put it later on. Just give them the good news first. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I mean, if you watched my my uh, any of my street preaching videos, uh, you'll see that uh, I'm trying to present not only the positive message because it, it really is good news. And right. unfortunately, Amen. there's a lot of people who when they preach, it doesn't even sound like good news. Well, it and, sounds like horrible news. Yeah. Right. So I want to make sure that it's good news. I want to make sure that there's a a, um, a good vibration, a friendly, loving environment, not only coming from me personally, but around me. I don't want it to be something that is like really a negative atmosphere. So um, you uh, you know you want to tell them about how God much God loves them, and 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 that there's good news, and that you do you want to have eternal life in in paradise. You know, the question like that's all positive, and then of course, the inevitable point comes that uh, you know that uh, you know as you discuss it further, these subjects of death and maybe the question of, of hell will, will even part, come into the the conversation. But I think you're right. Uh, the initial question, the best way to approach it is is from a, a positive perspective. So I'm thinking maybe the question is, uh, do you do you want to uh, receive eternal life in in uh, uh, in heaven, or but see the question is, when we say heaven, 
do we want to make sure they understand that this is going to be a physical heaven on earth, or can we leave, is it okay to leave them with this false conception that heaven uh, maybe, is some spiritual realm? Maybe a good question. Maybe a good question is to, and this could also kind of open the door for, um, open the door for the witness. You know, it's op open the door for you to bring the how and the why and the gospel into play. You start off by saying, starting a conversation with the person by simply asking them, asking them, do you truly realize the um, the awesomeness or the immensity of what is eternity? You know, what, what do you think about eternity? What do you think? What is eternity? The term. What does the word eternity mean to you? Yeah, you know, and kind of start start there. You know, mm -hmm. um, with the positive, like you said, with the positive side of it. Talk to them about the positive side of it. Well, this is eternity. You know, what, what are you like? Ask them what are their concepts? What do they think about eternity? Do they think there's an eternity? You know, maybe you think, that's a way you could spin it. Do you think maybe in this case the M Muslims may be right by just using the word paradise? Because paradise is just a, a positive word, and, and we think of paradise as like Adam and Eve lived in paradise in the Garden of Eden, and it's really a much more correct uh, expression of what we have to look forward to, this paradise on earth. Uh, do you want to have eternal life and paradise on earth? Maybe you could even phrase it as, uh, what, do you know you have the opportunity, or would you like to have the opportunity to, to go to the... Uh, physical yet spiritual paradise called heaven. Okay, I I think that we're we're kind of getting into splitting hairs here a little bit because it's true it's true that if they ask or if we can get into a conversation or if we have enough time, telling them about heaven is a good idea. But at the same time, one does not have to have a thorough knowledge of heaven and everything to get saved. Yeah. Right. But the question here, and that Randy asked in the book, and that I've suggested, and I think this is a good idea, is to train ourselves to use the right right words all the time. And because yeah. uh, if we don't, we're part of the problem by continuing the use of, of the incorrect terminology. Well, cor so, correct. I can't. I guess saying going to heaven, I'm not convinced as of yet, is the correct terminology. If that makes yeah, sense. it may it may not it, it may not be, but but the problem is what they think of heaven is probably far from what we think heaven is in, in, based on scriptures. Okay, all right, let's go on here. Um, resurrection day. What will it be like on our resurrection day when we return with Christ to this old earth, when we are given new bodies in the knowledge that we will together colonize a new earth, whether that is immediately or after a thousand years. Uh, at the end of my novel, Safely Home, I tried to catch a flavor of what it may be like. So he has a little excerpt from this novel. It says, the battle cry of a hundred million warriors erupted from one end of the heavens to the other. There was war on that narrow isthmus between heaven and hell, a planet called Earth. The air was filled with the din of combat the wails of oppressors being slain, and the joyous celebrations of the oppressed, rejoicing that at long last their liberator, liberators had arrived. Okay, he goes on. It's, uh, he says, Some of the warriors sang as they slew, swinging swords to hew uh, the oppressors with one arm and with the other, pulling victims up onto their horses. The long arm of the king moved with swiftness and power. The hope of reward that kept the sufferers sane was vindicated at last. No child of heaven was touched by the sword this day, for the universe could not tolerate the shedding of one more drop of righteous blood. This is quite a lengthy excerpt he has here. It's really uh, very good, but I don't know if I want to read that whole thing. But his, his point he's making here is talking about this uh, final battle, this final battle when Jesus gets the victory, uh, ending the tribulation and then beginning the millennium. Um, all right, we'll move on to uh, the next chapter, 14. I'm going to page Eric 138 at the bottom. The question of the millennium. 
Now, many have reduced the coming reign of Christ on earth to a thousand-year millennial kingdom on the old earth. Consequently, they have failed to understand the biblical promise of an eternal reign on the new earth. Because of this, it's necessary for us to take a closer look at the millennium, which has been the subject of considerable deliberate uh, debate, considerable debate throughout church history. Obviously, uh, I think everybody on the panel, uh, we all agree on this eschatology of uh, uh, a pre-tribulation rapture, mm -hmm. and then a and then a seven-year tribulation, mm -hmm. um, and, and then a uh, return of the Lord with victory, and then establishing a thousand-year physical reign as King on Earth, uh, and then the release of Satan, uh, and, and then. Uh, the final uh, destruction uh, and then uh, the judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne judgment, and then the destruction of the heavens and the earth and the recreation of a new heaven and a new earth. That's the way I see it. If you, anybody on the panel uh, sees this sequence differently, go ahead and express that. Um, I I haven't, uh, I guess, made a, a uh, solid decision. I've heard as far as the the, when the rapture of the church will occur, I've heard very compelling arguments for all, for all views, and uh, I, I have leaned more towards the pre-tribulation view just because it makes the most sense with the uh, uh, teaching of imminency, and uh, that's, I guess, just my thoughts on the matter. Mm -hmm. I think of all of these events I've made and mentioned in this uh, kind of timeline I outlined there, uh, the, the least important is uh, the... Uh, timing of the rapture. Uh, right. We just know that there's going to be a rapture where it's, whether it's just before or in the middle or near the end of the tribulation, the church, is, we believers are going to be caught up and resurrected. Uh, so, um, and then all the rest of the things will happen in that, in that order. Right. So, I think everybody's in, a, in agreement with that timeline, even though maybe some people are watching that will, uh, you know, see these end times differently than, than we do. Um, it says, Revelation chapter 20 refers six times to the millennium, describing it like this. The devil is bound for a thousand years. That's verse 2. For a thousand years the nations are no longer deceived. That's verse 3. The saints come to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 4. The rest of the dead don't come to life until after the thousand years are ended. Verse 5. Um, the saints will be priests and kings for a thousand years, verse 6, and Satan will look at, will, will be loosed at the end of a thousand years and he will prompt a final human rebellion against God, verse 7 and 8. So that kind of, um, I didn't know that was coming up next, but I, for some reason, I know where he's going sometimes, I just, uh, so I'm able to say something ahead of where I'm reading it. So. That his his timeline there agrees with the timeline that, that I just uh, outlined. I'd like though, Eric, could you get could you go to uh, Revelation 20? Sure. And let's go look at these verses uh, two through eight, and and read them for ourselves and see if the it says what what Randy is saying. Sure. Okay, Revelation chapter 20, verse two through eight. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judged, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. 
Yeah, I was just thinking about that today. And, and, and look, the question is, who are those that reign with Christ there? Uh, it says in verse 4, the saints come to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Can you read verse 4 again, Eric? Sure. Verse 4 says, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay. So in that, in that particular verse, it's talking about the, uh, the tribulation martyrs. Right. Right. We're already, we're already with Christ in heaven at that point. Um, and now they're talking about the people who died in the, in the in the process of the tribulation. Okay, and the martyrs, I guess, as a reward, get to reign or something. Would also would also reign. They'll they'll also reign. All also in addition to who? Though. To us, to us, those who have been raptured and returned with Christ. So every every believer will reign with Christ. Is that what is that is that what you're saying? Because this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Yes. I don't have a position. I don't have a position on this, but it's just it, it, it it's. Been, it's been something I've been thinking about a lot is who are the people who reign because in in Second Timothy, uh, I think it's I think yeah chapter one shovel at Harding's that was that it's like chapter two or let's see what what let me let me just get the verse. Hey guys, I wanted to say real fast. I'm gonna I have to leave a little earlier this time. I apologize. I did want to help out brother Mike though. Uh, brother Mike, if you ever need to mute. Uh, your microphone, there's a little uh, button at the top right next to your camcorder button and then there's a bandwidth button right to the far left icon. If you click that, it will mute your microphone. If you're okay. Ready. I see it. So the verse I was thinking of Austin, was... Guys, well, let's say goodbye one. to brother, uh, brother Austin first, okay? Austin, thanks for joining us. Thank you, guys. Love you much. God bless. Bye, God bless bye you Austin. All right, so the, the, all right, so so this is why why I ask this. This is actually quite relevant, and I wonder if Randy Alcorn talks about this. Um, 2 Timothy two twelve says, "If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will he also will deny us." And and um, 2 Timothy two eleven, the verse of this is, "If we died with him, we shall also live with him." So I'm wondering if um. It, 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 I know that there's there, there there are some people who think that all saints will reign with Christ, which seems, in my opinion, to be kind of strange because who would there be to reign over? And then others think reigning is like an eternal reward. And one of the cases where the rewards is in Revelation chapter two. It talks about he who overcometh and keeps my works to the end. It says he shall I give a rod of iron that he will reign over the nations. And it's, it's interesting we read this passage because I've been thinking about this all day today. Well, you say you asked the question as far as who they were reign. You're talking about the people who are going into the millennium who are going to repopulate. Yeah, who is a reign? The are there some years? Christians who don't reign? Is the question. Um, I, I would say Christians. I would say the Christians who actually. Who make it through and live through the tribulation are are not going to reign. I don't think they're going to reign. I think they're going to be the ones to be populating the earth, uh, repopulating the earth. Then how do you okay rebuilding the you, nations? How do you interpret um, Second Timothy two twelve that I just read? If we endure, and it's talking about just like us in general, we'll also reign with them. Verse two eleven says, if if we died with him, we should also live with him. And um, and also revelation too about keeping our works to the end will also because well, obviously we know that salvation is not by works so well well I just wanted to add that uh, wouldn't there be uh, partial works for salvation during the tribulation period because obviously the mark of the beast it it says in uh, I believe it's Revelation fourteen. That promises uh, condemnation. Well, that that's a different topic than what I'm what I'm bringing up here. That's not at all what I'm bringing up. I'm bringing up: is there a condition for rain, reigning? Is reigning separate from just being saved or being a saint? Well, Jackson, uh, when, when you've made the point that uh, you can't reign unless there's someone to reign over, uh -huh. uh, I, I would like to ask you then: in eternity, uh, it, I believe that we're uh, all of us will be reigning 
uh, jointly, jointly with Christ. So who are we going to be reigning over if we all get to reign? Maybe it's over the creation. As Adam and Eve were reigning, they had stewardship over the earth. That could be. That could that 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 um that definitely could be. I mean, we do know that there will be different possess positions in heaven and whatnot. <coughs> some reigning, yeah. reigning over some. That could be too. But I'm wondering, how do we, if we're free grace people, how do we reconcile? Second Timothy two twelve and Revelation <coughs> chapter two when it talks about keeping. We the have work. to. We would yeah. have to start with uh, with first with uh, Second Thessalonians from the very beginning to get the whole context of all that because I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I can't tell you off the top of my head. But a lot of times, endure because uh, the endurers are anybody who believes is an endurer. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody who believes is a, is an overcomer. Uh, anyone right. who who endures yes. is Amen. holy. In other words, yes. you've got to be holy, you've got to be an overcomer, you've got to endure. When you are a believer, that's what you are. These are interchangeable terms. But there is a time where uh, uh, enduring uh, refers to enduring through the tribulation period. Um, and, and those who endure to the end shall be saved. And mm -hmm. I believe that's talking about uh, getting through the tribulation without uh, being caught and, and having to go and be beheaded. They've endured it and <laughs> were able to be spared from that. Yeah, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Well, about these specific verses, sometime later we'll talk about them. Then, yeah, I, I think that'd be good. Maybe, maybe after the show we can read that whole yeah. part of. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. it's Timothy. It's Second Timothy. It's not Thessalonians. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Timothy. But I mean, yeah, Timothy, I, I, Timothy is a pastoral epistle too. So you gotta you gotta read Timothy in in the in the uh, through the lens of uh, teaching him how to be a pastor. Right. Right. Okay, so now theologians differ over whether the millennium should be understood as a literal thousand-year reign and when it will occur in relation to the second coming of Christ. Christians generally hold one of three views about millennium, post-millennial, pre-millennial, or amillennial. Okay, here's the post-millennial viewpoint. Christ's kingdom is spreading throughout the world. And God's justice will prevail across the earth prior to Christ's return. After his reign is established through his people for a long duration, not necessarily a literal thousand years, Christ will physically return to an already uh, utopian world. Now that's post-millennialism, and that would be the viewpoint of the Roman Catholic Church, for example. They believe the millennium is happening now, and the millennium is not a literal thousand-year period. It just goes on until it's uh, it's until until Christ returns. But in the meantime, uh, Christ is on the throne, and uh, the the Pope is the vicar of Christ, representing Christ on the throne of the earth. So that would be post-millennialism. So what's your viewpoint on that? Uh, I'm I'm definitely pre-millennial myself. I don't think that. It, to me, it's very weird in any way. I mean, not not to to call what we have on earth the, as being God's kingdom, because it says Satan is the god of this world and everything. Mm -hmm. it, to me, if Satan's the god of this world, how could that be called Christ's kingdom? Yeah. Uh, to me, the most glaring problem with that is that uh, the millennium is, uh, as we read the descriptions of the millennium, it's it's really a wonderful situation uh, until the Satan's re released and then this rebellion. Uh, but so it's really wonderful, and I don't see the world right now uh, since the church was established until the return of Christ. Roman Catholics say that's the millennium. That's the the the, the kingdom is in force right now. And if that's the case, why is the world so bad? Why are there still all these wars and 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 horrible things happening? This you know, I think like that, wonderful to me. Yeah, I, I think a common um, a common problem with these these eschatologies, whether it be like like preterism or post millennial or whatever, or or even or even in in one sense hyper hyper dispensationalism. You'll see why I mentioned that in a second. Is they're all trying to make now better than it is, if that makes sense. And they're, they, you know what I'm saying, like even the hyperdies say this is the only age we'll ever be saved by grace in or whatever. It's all like making these times something special when they really don't seem to be to me at all. Yeah, yeah, good. I think that's a very good point. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. 
I just was wondering something because it says that uh, this is just something that blows my mind that Satan will be loose to season and go out and deceive the nations. Now, will he? Uh, I guess my I guess I sh should go back a little bit further. Will unbelievers survive the tribulation? Because who gets deceived in the aftermath? Is it going to well, be Christians or unbelievers? Well, the question was what? Will unbelievers what? Will unbelievers, his question is, will unbelievers make it through the tribulation, people who don't believe if they didn't accept either thing? And I'd say the answer to that question is yes, there will be. Unbelievers survive the tribulation? Yes. It does not say that, the tribulation doesn't say that everyone who's not a believer is going to accept the mark. It says there's some people who, there's some people who, and I'm assuming, but I'm sure there are people who won't make a decision either way. And won't they, they be won't. hunted down to the unbelievers? Well, well along with Christians, but you may you may find people who who side with people who you know, who are Christian who don't really want to make the necessary necessarily the next step. I mean, it doesn't. The Bible doesn't split the groups into two groups. It says these this group's going to make it. This group's not going to make it. It doesn't. It doesn't really say through the tribulation. It says that things are going to be in turmoil, and so there will be people who maybe never accept it. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I think that the the, uh, the terminology "sheep and goats" expresses that there's the, the sheep are those people in the tribulation who are saved, and the goats are those that are lost. And I think the fate of the goats is uh, death. Uh, At that I think, point, I think, yeah, I think, I think yeah, destroyed. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. When Jesus comes now. Right. So, but everybody who goes into the millennium, though, these are the people who uh, were not uh, destroyed. Who were goats by Jesus, and then and then who were not destroyed by Satan by be, being being headed, right. and were able to survive somehow, and and yet now they get to go through the millennium, and I I think that the the aging process is going to be different at that time because some of them will right. be living as long as a thousand years, and people will be born, they'll be giving birth and having families and so on, uh, but these people, uh, faith is not required. Mm -hmm. At that point, because Jesus is with them, right? So to, clar way, to clarify, you don't believe that unbelievers will make it through the tribulation, or you do? I do not, not not okay. through the tribulation. No, no. Now you're so then when you go into the millennium, it's made up of these uh, people who are helping Jesus reign, who are the martyrs, and perhaps us. Uh, that I'm not sure without looking at it again. And then you've got the people who survived, and they will be multiplying. Imagine a thousand years with right. like no, no wars and no problems and stuff. The population is going to grow. There may be in the millennium a population of people that is many times greater than it is today. Because that's, that's uh, because point. they're going to be uh, probably right repopulating the earth so, right. so, so greatly. But these people are going to be like Adam and Eve in, in the sense that Adam and Eve didn't have faith. God walked with them. They saw him, just like Thomas didn't have faith. He, he, he touched Jesus. Or he, we, we don't know if he touched him, but we saw him. He saw him resurrected, so it wasn't faith anymore. Faith is, is uh, without seeing. Right. So these right. people, since they get to see Jesus and see him reign as king, literal king in a physical world, uh, faith is not, not part of it. So what I think what the reason, this has been my theory for a long time. I don't I don't know if anybody I've never heard anybody say this before, but I think there I've always wondered why is Satan released from the bottomless pit? What's the point of that? And I think it's because every group of people throughout time had to make a choice. Uh, the angels had to make a choice. Uh, Satan, uh, Lucifer led a rebellion, and they had to choose. You want God or you want Lucifer? Adam and Eve had to make a choice. Do you want God or do you want to, to believe the devil and, and uh, rebel and be independent? Uh, and now you and I, we all had to make a choice. Do we want to believe in Jesus or believe in ourselves? Uh, and now these people in the millennium, They'll they have, have to make, to make a, choice. a choice too. They get to see Jesus, but now Satan comes back. Now there's a choice. Okay, you've had lived under the reign of Jesus Christ all this time. Now you've got Satan uh, Lucifer, and uh, he's going to convince some people to go with him. Thank you for that. That that does yeah. shed some light on the on the topic because I, I was discussing that with a friend. We couldn't 
uh, I never even thought about the sheep and goats scriptures that you mentioned when we were discussing that, and that it does make a lot more sense how a kind of recreation of Adam and Eve, how they, uh, they yeah, they won't require faith, so they would, they would be, uh, I guess, I don't want to say more vulnerable, but they would, they would have this the same type of a uh, replay of temptation to. Yeah, th this, this, this is my pr my problem with with uh, the pr uh, concept in Calvinism of um, um, uh, uh, unconditional election. In other words, uh, that uh, there is a condition. God God throughout all of time has had one condition in all of His creation. And that is, uh, He's given us a freedom to choose Him or to reject Him. Right. Everybody, everybody, every creature, uh, you know, the angels and man and in, in the future, always has to get this, uh, there's a condition. you got to choose. you want God or do you want something else instead? And God, for some reason, doesn't want us robots where he's just programmed us and you don't have to get to choose him or reject him. He wants us to be free to choose him or reject him. There are. I just wanted to bring this up because there, there, there are those out there who do believe, and I'm just. I was just mentioning that as a possibility. Um, there are those who believe that uh, there are there will be some unbelievers who make it through the tribulation, for whatever reason. I don't know what the reasons are, but there are those who believe. There, some people who believe that. Um, simply because, um, and I, I understand what you're saying about the goats, uh, the sheep and the goats. Um, but there have been some arguments made about that as to where it, it will not be complete elimination. Because the, one of the interesting things I heard brought up, and I don't want to go off on another subject, but one of the things that interesting I heard brought up was um, the fact that people who live through the tribulation are technically still in their sin. And that's one of the problems. Their children will still be born with the, the ability to make a choice. Like you were saying, there's those who were born in the tribulation, they're also going to grow up in a world that never knew a world before without Christ. They never knew that. They never understood that. So they'll probably take that for granted, and when Satan is loosed, he'll try to lead a rebellion. I mean, you have to have people that are willing to, some people who are willing to rebel for him to lead a rebellion, or else a rebellion makes no sense. It doesn't make a point. I mean, it, what's the point in him leading a rebellion if there are no people to, to, to go for it? Yeah. So well, uh, I'm going to admit that you know this eschatology is not my strong suit. You know I can talk a lot about it, but I can't talk expertly with great confidence about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do. You know there is a a theory that uh, the Holy Spirit will not be uh, on the earth because you know when we're taken away, the Holy Spirit's gone. So right. in in the tribulation and in the millennium, these people are not going to be spirit indwelled and, and regenerated. Uh, but they are going to be um, kind of set aside because they they didn't take the mark and put their right. faith in Jesus, and yet right. there's still there's still this final test for them, and that is in the millennium they're going right. to have to choose uh, Satan's released, and now you get now the time of testing is is there. Will you choose Jesus? You've been with him for a thousand years, or are you going to reject him and right. choose Lucifer? Right. Right. Okay, now the next point he says is talks about premillennial viewpoint. Now this is the one that I think that we all uh, hold to. Yes. That Jesus is mm -hmm. going to set up his kingdom, uh, he'll return and then set up a thousand year kingdom. Right. Which would include much of the dispensational theology and the teaching of a variety of scholars throughout church history. The millennium will be a literal thousand year reign of Christ which will begin immediately upon his return when he defeats his enemies of the, in the Battle of Armageddon. During these thousand years, God's promises of the Messiah's earthly reign will be fulfilled. Redeemed Jews will live in their homeland, and according to some teaching, the church will govern the world with Christ. The millennium will end with a final rebellion, and the old earth will be replaced by or transformed into the new earth. So that's the viewpoint of premillennialism, and uh, as I said, I I I hold to the pre-tribulation rapture and the premillennial return of Jesus. Uh, but these are not things that uh, uh, I think everybody should be dividing over. Even though there are some people that are really radical on how how important they think the English right is. Mm. Then you have the amillennial viewpoint, including most Reformed theology and the teaching of many scholars throughout church history, the millennium isn't a literal thousand years, nor is it a future state. 
Rather, the events depicted in Revelation 20, verses 3 through 7, are happening right now as Christ's church reigns with him over the earth in victorious triumph empowered by his death and resurrection. The saints rule over the earth from the intermediate heaven where they dwell with Christ. I don't see much difference between amillennial and postmillennial, do you? It's only a nuance. Um, I just want to say I think we need to be really... Um, you're right about, about not dividing over minor issues. So don't take that as a contradiction, but there's a reason, I think, that dispensationalism usually goes with correct views on soteriology. Because if you look at Scripture like Reformed people do, you have a tendency, I've noticed, and I used to go to Reformed Church and everything, to say, oh, well, this is symbolic for this, or this actually means this, and, and that kind of thing. Believe actually means be a disciple and all that stuff, and I think you can end up with some very dangerous conclusions. Yeah, I think the difference. Um, you were saying you didn't see a difference. The difference yeah. is the amillennialist believes in not a literal thousand years. The the amillennialist believes that, for instance, we're living in what is a quote unquote the millennium right now. We're living in that period. That's that's what we're living in right now. It's not literally a thousand years. Postmillennialists actually believe in a thousand years, but that the events happen after the thousand years. So they believe things happen after a literal thousand years. So that's where I think they're different. Well, I, I don't think that's correct, at least according to what Randy Elkhorn wrote here, you, on page 139 in the middle it said, from a post-millennial viewpoint, Christ's kingdom is spreading throughout the world and God's justice will prevail across the earth prior to Christ's return after his reign is established through his people for a long duration, not necessarily a thousand years. Christ will physically return to an already utopian world. It seems to me that they both don't I think it's a literal thousand years, but the postman believe he's going to return, and the amillennial don't think he's going to return. He's just going to reign from, from heaven, and the saints are going to reign from heaven. Yeah, I, I would say that's the, the thing that distinguishes, the big thing that distinguishes between the two, yes, is that, yeah. yes. But I do, but there are people who believe postmillennially in a thousand years from a point, from a certain point. Mm -hmm. They just believe that certain things won't come to conclusion until after a thousand years um, that we believe are going to happen before. Yeah. I, I do want to uh, support um, Jackson's position that if we – people who get this wrong, in, in my opinion, the correct is pre-trib rapture, pre-millennial return. Right. So if, pe if people, if people uh, come to another conclusion about these end times, then they also tend to misunderstand other things like discipleship versus believers yes. and these other things. Uh, and uh, I know Dr. Ruckman in his books, uh, uh, he's emphasized that over and over again, that the, this false understanding of this eschatology leads to wrong conclusions about uh, salvation too. Yeah. The pre right, right. The pre the, what Jackson was saying, and I'm in total, total agreement with both of you. I was simply throwing out other views people are saying. The, the, the only view that fits perfectly in place is the premillennial pre-tribulation view. It's the only one that fits in all places. It's the only one that fits. The minute you go outside of that, you have to symbolize, stretch things, and start putting things out of place. You, you have to start juggling things. Well, let, me also say, let me also say to support Eric... Uh, to just, just add to the building blocks here. I, I personally view, um, view post-millennialism, all-millennialism, covenant theology, non-dispensationalism, preterism, all that stuff as being akin or equivalent to theistic evolution. Is it a salvation issue? No, but it's, it's in my opinion, just making the Bible say something it just doesn't say, if that makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. it's yeah. saying this is symbolic, you know, because there are people out there, including some saved people, who think that Adam and Eve were not actual people, and were just like, that's just a story, like a parable or something. Yeah, I've, heard, I've heard that too, that, that yeah. uh, much of the, I've actually heard that from personal testimony, someone who believed that all of the Old Testament uh, quote unquote account. I mean, I want to say stories, but that you know, you talk about correcting language accounts are parables and not real uh, occurrences. Well, see, that, that there's an extreme example. Someone who says the whole Old Testament. But what I'm saying is, 
the, the, the thing about dispensationalism is it views all of these things, even if, it, even if two people disagreed on the length of the days in Genesis or whatever, as being events that happened and then the end times as events that will happen, right. whereas you have just this big mishmash of, of muddy water mm -hmm. when you get into this Reformed theology thing, and then if, if you've got mud in the water, you know, it starts to starts to expand and everything, and mm -hmm. salvation can become unclear in people's minds. So while I don't want anyone to say, to, to, to misinterpret what I'm saying, to say, you, to, 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 to think that you have to believe in dispensationalism to be saved, I'm not saying that either, but right. I am saying I think these other points of view are dangerous. I am comfortable with making that statement. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would phrase it this way. Uh, if someone believes in post-trib, post-millennial, whatever, um, and then I queried them and found that they agree with me on salvation, then I wouldn't have any problem with their eschatology. I will accept it even though I disagree with it. But it's, it's more likely that if they got that eschatology wrong, then, th that their, then their soteriology, their understanding of salvation, is going to be wrong too. It's very common for that to happen. Now, mm -hmm. I want to ask Jackson a question about this dispensationalism. You bring it up a lot, and you know, I've studied uh, Larkin and uh, Ruckman quite a bit, and that they've really broken this down. Uh, as you said, said, Jackson, into these seven uh, dispensations. Uh, and I, I, think, I think it's very interesting, and I think it's very, very true in terms of uh, breaking down these eras of history in terms of what man under, man knew. The amount of knowledge that, that was available to, to, to man about God. Uh, but what I, I think you're agreeing with me on this is that even though you, you, you can see these distinctions that we, you call dispensations, that throughout all of those dispensations, man still got saved the same way through them all. And that was because of faith in God to save him. It was always grace and always faith. It's just the amount of knowledge that God dispensed in a dispensation was 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 um, less, and now it's more and more. And now we have a fuller understanding that this God that saves us is actually Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. Yes, yes, I, I fully agree that it's always been in all throughout all of these by by grace through faith. I do think the exact content of saving faith changed somewhat because I don't believe like David trusted yeah. Jesus as his savior. Yeah. But he did have faith and that was counted as righteousness. So I would say what's changed is the content of saving faith. Yeah. Well, see, not, that's, not that it used to be by works, like an yeah. ultra dispensationalist would yeah. say. So we agree completely on this, and then that's why I've actually moved away from even referring to myself as dispensationalist, because commonly with dispensationalism, people do not agree that as you and I do, that it's always been faith. In, in what God has imparted, but it, it has been uh, some kind of works in addition to it, either you know following laws or doing uh, some kind of uh, other things are required besides simply faith in what well, God reveals. This, this is the confusion between ultra dispensationalism and uh, and regular dispensationalism. For example, H. A. Ironside was an early dispensationalist. J. Vernon McGee. Um, H. A. Ironside actually wrote a booklet in which he argued against ultra dispensationalism for uh, for 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 the same for making the error that we're talking about now. So I think people need to get educated that these are not the same theologies: regular dispensationalism and yeah. ultra. But the, the distinction I'm liking, and I'm I'm glad and really really happy. First of all, the time we're living in today, if 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 we agree that it's it's by grace through faith, nothing else, uh, then then I don't care if someone thinks in times past or in times future that it's different. It doesn't matter right, to me if, right. they, if they think it's, it's different before or in the future. As long as they get it right right now, that's what is important to me. That, that, that's but, very true. That's very true. It's just that if somebody asks us or asks me, um, were people saved by works in the Old Testament? I'd be happy to show them why I don't think so. But yes, that that's okay. definitely not an essential but, for. Yeah, here's my here's where I'm like uh, splitting hairs with you. Is that is that um, you and I agree completely on on this point? However, uh, you 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 take almost all people who are uh, who uh, you know. Uh, 
promote this concept dispensationalism, dispensationalism. And I'm not talking about hyperdies now, I'm just talking about regular dispensational uh, viewpoint. They do not agree that it's always been grace and faith. They've always felt, they feel that, you no, know, there's some other requirements throughout, his, throughout time that was also part of it. So you're, you and I are, would not fit in that, that mold, even though we concede the dispensations. We, we think that the way people got saved was always through faith in what God revealed to them. Right. I mean, I, I guess you're right that there is confliction even within its own camp. I would, I would like to argue that the old the old timers like H. A. Ironside, J. Vernon McGee, and and others like that, you know, in Dallas, really are are not teaching that I've ever seen that people were saved by works at one point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know Ruckman does. Right, uh, Ruckman, Ruckman is does, and 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 uh, and Larkin does, and others. But I don't know Ironsides and the others. So you're right. There, there may be a variety of viewpoints within that umbrella of dispensationalism. Yeah. But I, I, to me, I divided only one way. I divided it at the cross. Uh, people in the past uh, needed to get saved through this blood sacrifice, but they had to look to it in the future. Uh, we get saved through this blood sacrifice, and we look at it in the, as a past event. All right. Uh, let me see. So theologians who hold to a amillennial or premillennial viewpoint differ on specific details, even within their own camps. For instance, according to dispensational premillennialism, the rapture will occur prior to the tribulation, and both will occur prior to the final return of Christ to earth. According to historic premillennialism, the rapture is an inseparable part of Christ's single physical return to earth, which will occur after the tribulation. Though I don't believe the case for postmillennialism is strong, either biblically or in light of human history, both premillennialism and amillennialism uh, have many um, biblical points in their favor. All right, well, I won't go into that. We've discussed the millennialism enough. Uh, so, anybody else want to say anything about uh, millennialism before we move on and the rapture? Um, I'll just say something that kind of has stood out in my mind about the tribulation uh, and getting confused on the, the different uh, theologies mm -hmm. that a lot of people that get confused on it start thinking that the church has replaced the Jewish people, and uh, I, I believe that can lead to an agreement that confusion on these er areas can lead to other uh, heretical views. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and that's that's very true. That's called replacement theology. That, right. that the church has replaced uh, Jerusalem. All the promises that were made to Jerusalem uh, no longer apply to them. The church inherited them instead. Yeah. And I don't agree with that at all, uh, but I think, brother, to to uh, this kind of gives me a chance to reinforce my uh, point I made with you er, in an earlier conversation. I think it's wise for every person, before they start con coming to all these theological conclusions, read the Gospel of John 100 times, right. read the epistles of Paul 100 times. Get this correct theology or soteriology, this correct understanding of salvation, so ingrained in it's in your genetic code now. And there, then when you go through all the other scriptures and all these other questions on theology come up, then uh, you're going to at least be able to see it through the light of the proper uh, salvation. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the promised new world. A dominant theme in Old Testament prophecies involves God's plan for an earthly kingdom of righteousness. This pertains to the earth in general and Jerusalem in particular. Isaiah, for example, repeatedly anticipates this coming new world. The Messiah, quote, will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom forever, Isaiah 9-7. David's throne was an earthly one with an earthly past and an earthly future. Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10, um, we're told of the Messiah's mission to earth. He will defend the poor and the exploited. He will rule against the wicked and destroy them. 
with the lifting of the curse, the Messiah will bring peace to the animal kingdom. The wolf will live with the lamb. Uh, the leopard will lie down with the goat. This fulfills the deliverance spoken of in Romans 8. Isaiah says there will be no more, no harm or destruction in Jerusalem, verse 9. The Messiah will stand as a banner for the peoples, and the nations will rally to him. His place of rest will be glorious. This anticipates Revelation 21 and 22. Um, isn't Isaiah amazing? I mean, he not only uh, prophecies this this uh, eschatology, but he's also prophesying that in Isaiah 53 this this uh, cross, this uh, sacrifice of Jesus. So explicitly, here's something I find interesting. That's kind of you might think this is a minor, uh, not even important to this topic. But uh, have you ever heard that people say uh, in the yeah the, in the, in the future the the lion will lay down with the lamb? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, well, we, let's not make that mistake because it's not the lion that will lay down the lamb. Scripture says the wolf will live or lie down with the lamb. That's what it says right here. It's the wolf will live, lie down with the lamb, not the lion. So, you know, don't misquote that. Otherwise, uh, people will question your, uh, you know, how if you really know scripture if you're going to make that mistake. Okay. So, uh, what do you think of Isaiah? Isaiah is not only the book of Revelation, but the book of Isaiah tells us so much about this this uh, millennial time. All right. I, I wonder if during the millennium it's going to be like, um, this is so good, how could it possibly be better? And after the thousand years and the new heavens and new earth come, it'll be like, wow, I didn't realize it even could get better than what we had. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you're right, and it's it's described to be so good that it makes me wonder how could anybody think that we're in this millennial period right now? Because <laughs> who thinks that the world as it is today is so so wonderful? I think I said that. I think I made that statement once before. I said I don't I don't get where they think that. I just don't understand where they think there's anything to support that. Well, it, it's interesting because um, it, it, I I. I don't know. I can't put words in these people's mouths. I haven't really t talked to them or asked them this question, but maybe they would say it's not that we're saying the world is very good, but the Bible does isn't acting like it'll be all good or something, and that we're reading too much into that or something like that. That's the best I can say to try to fairly represent them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I, I just I think it's impossible to make the case. To, to make the case that this is Christ's reign right now. It just doesn't I, – I, how can you look around the world and, and say that this is Christ's reign? It doesn't well, – what, what do these people think of when, when Jesus says Satan is the god of this world? You know, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think for the most part people dis discount that. They don't, they don't even – they might not even be aware that line is in Scripture. Yeah, I, I would like to – add on to that, people just might be in ignorance of that. Uh, yeah. I've talked to Brother Luke, I've got uh, Catholic family members, and I wasn't even fully aware of the post-millennial view on that, and uh, it makes it makes some sense on some passive comments I've made about uh, for instance, I, I, I drew a sidewalk drawing one time, it said I'll fly away, and they just looked at me like I was crazy, like what do you mean you're going to fly away? And I know that's not again. That's not the correct terminology. Will be changed, but you get you get my point. That uh, and then I and then I asked him about uh, or, or I mentioned something to him about like a, a certain prophecy, and they automatically went back to the past. Well, well, Michael, it, it, it's not the Battle of Armageddon yet. It's it's. Uh, I remember when we had to black out the windows for World War II, and basically they go back to saying that it was uh, worse in the past, and that I guess somehow trying to justify that it's getting better, but it's actually getting worse. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah, yeah. like it's interesting because I had a college class last semester where this guy. It was it was like this this health and the mind class, and this guy just wanted to you know give all of his his life advice and everything. It's like wow, I knew the world was messed up, but I didn't know it was this messed up. And his his whole premise was like his his whole premise was like people are good, people are good, people are good. And it's like everyone around me was just like buying into this and everything. I don't know. I mean, hopefully these these post millennial or all millennial types or whatever wouldn't be so absurd as to act like that's the case that we're looking around and people are good. Mm hmm. Yeah, the only way that you could think people are good is to um, do it in a, uh, a relative comparison of other people. Uh, like uh, I know that uh, uh, Eric is, is relatively good because comparing Eric to a lot of people I know, he's far better. And yet I could probably find somebody that I could say, well, this person's better than Eric as far as you know. They're always doing the right thing, you know, and so on. And it, it, that's man looks at man and, and, and it's relativity, relatively good. But um, the real measuring stick is Jesus Christ, Amen. and uh, uh, he is the glory of God. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God, and this is Jesus Christ. So if we are measuring everybody in the world against Jesus Christ, making that comparison, then you can't say anyone is good. <laughs> I think I think the problem. I think you're right, Luke, and I'd be the first one to admit you could find lots of people who are be, who are better than me. So, <laughs> um, but hey, first I said there's a you're better than a lot of other people. I know, and I was like I was like no, please stop, stop, don't say that because it's like that. There are far people far better than me who've done far more than I have. But um, I, I think it's I think it's worse than that. It's deeper and it's darker than that. I think that morality has been so skewed and twisted in humanity that the evil that is done is now taken so much for granted and is so it happens so uh, everybody is thinks you know it's hard to put into words it's it's been skewed in such a way where the lines are so blurred that you can't even tell the difference anymore and i think the line in scripture where it says woe to those who call good evil and evil good was never truer of our time yeah, and I think that's the big part of it. I mean, people think, oh, it was worse in other times. It was worse in other times. No, it wasn't. It was not worse in other times. It's worse in this time yeah. because we do evil so easily. It comes so easily and is not seen as evil. It's not only not seen as evil, but it's celebrated. Yeah. That's the and problem. I would, I would dare say, uh, I would uh, think that some are in agreement here that it's getting to the point of pre-flood bad. That yeah. Oh, was, absolutely. In fact, that's why Christ equates, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be, the coming of the Son of Man. I mean, it, it, what was the world like before then? Well, the the thought, man's thoughts of his heart were evil all the time. Um, and violence covered the earth. So we know, and yet Christ tells us at the same time that people married, were given in marriage, they were acting at that time as if there was no problem, even though there was a huge problem. Right. So it's 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 there the mirror image of that time and this time is chilling. And people the fact that people don't even see it and they're so blinded to it, that makes it even more chilling. It, yeah. And to me the comparison that comes to mind is uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, the, the Bible describes Sodom and Gomorrah as so sinful and yet uh, you could go to any big city in America today and it's no different than Sodom and Gomorrah. No. Now, I just want to state a, a quick point on that. People automatically think of the sexual sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, but it was the compilation of sins that made it so bad. It wasn't just this one specific thing, and that's what I think it, in our culture co commonly gets emphasized with the with the gay marriages and you know the LBG, LB, LGBT whatever acronym community. So I just throw that out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Uh, I've had uh, street preachers that you know I've known over the years that for some reason they seem to be obsessed with homosexuality. Uh, it makes me wonder what's really going on with them that they're it's it's their total preoccupation with this one sin. Uh, and 
uh, they, they put it like above and beyond any other sin. Uh, they've said to me, you don't really think a practicing homosexual can be saved, do you, Luke? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and just as just as much as, as a practicing uh, egotistical, prideful, <laughs> uh, self-righteous person like you. Right, or, or, or a person, or, or a practicing liar, or a practicing yeah, right. person who has hateful or murderous thoughts, who, who, that never get beyond thoughts, they're just thoughts, yeah. that the, those sins in the eyes of God are all, yeah. all the bad. The important thing for anybody uh, in the audience or who watches this video to understand is that uh, um, whether it's sexual sin or any other type of sin, whether it's, it's an act of sin or even a thought of sin, uh, it's all, they're all sin. But the good news is that all sin of all kinds, the totality of all sin, was yeah. paid for on the cross by Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So the good news is you're not under condemnation for your sin. You should jump for joy that, that now you can have a relationship with Jesus because he paid for your sin. All that's required of you is now you've got to embrace Jesus as your Savior, put your faith in him, and he'll give you eternal life. I think I think I think we should. I, that's I'm glad you guys said that because I think we should put that into perspective. People get very hypocritical and they tend to drop their own sins in favor of a me, what they consider to be a mega sin. But let me clue people in: people who are sexually promiscuous with the opposite sex in the eyes of God are just as wrong as those people who are promiscuous in homosexual sex. It's the same. God sees it all the same. So if you're promiscuous with with the opposite sex, it's the same as being, you know, promiscuous with uh, in homosexual sex. It's the same thing. It's outside of marriage. It's in, it's both be, both are viewed as sin by God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so referring to Isaiah and the prophecies, the question is, where will this happen? Not up there in a distant heaven, but down here on earth in Jerusalem. As we saw in chapter 9, Isaiah 60 uh, speaks of the city gates always being open because there are no longer any enemies. And in words nearly identical those of John concerning the new earth, uh, it speaks of nations and kings bringing in their wealth. It tells of God's light replacing the suns and promises that your days of sorrow will end uh, two prophecies clearly fulfilled in Revelation. <coughs> you know, I haven't read uh, Isaiah that that many times. I've read Revelation probably a lot more times. But it is interesting how so many things. Ezekiel is also full of uh, end times prophecies. Uh, yes. But it, it seems like so many times people rely only on the Book of Revelation. Uh, rather than uh, knowing that there's so much to learn from Isaiah and Ezekiel too. Well, the, well, and the other one, the other large one is you can't really fully understand eschatology unless you combine Daniel with Revelation. Yes, Dan oh. Daniel's the key to the whole thing. Yeah, so that's true. Very true. I think your your coffee mugs are getting bigger, brother Luke. <laughs> This mug here, a lot of people think it's a very large mug, but this mug is actually the, just the regular size of a little coffee cup. It's just that I have an extraordinary small head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Jackson, that was an attempt at humor, <laughs> not to be taken literally. I didn't okay. know you were a microcephalic. <laughs> Microcephalic. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, quote, see, your Savior comes. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. Unquote. That's Isaiah 62. This statement reappears in Revelation 22 in the words of Jesus Christ. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. The preoccupation with God's establishment of an earthly kingdom couldn't be more clear than it is in Isaiah 65. Quote, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be, <coughs> will be heard in it no more. 
They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all of my holy mountain, says the Lord. That's in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. I, th I think I'm reading the Revelation, mm -hmm. and it, that was in Isaiah. Yep. If I read that and didn't tell you it was Isaiah, would you probably think it was Revelation, wouldn't you? Probably. Man. So even in Isaiah, you know, this is not just some New Testament uh, book of Revelation that some people like, you know, think book of Revelation is some weird, hard to understand thing, and that uh, you know uh, they don't know what to take it, make of it. And yet, even in Isaiah, mm -hmm. he's telling the same thing. Mm -hmm. The new earth will be the setting for God's kingdom. The new Jerusalem will be where people come to pay him tribute. Quote. As the new heavens and the new earth that I will make endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. All mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. Isaiah 66. Those who insist that Revelation 21 and 22 should be understood figuratively must then also take all the Isaiah passages figuratively. <laughs> But Jewish scholars understood them literally. There's very, every indication Jesus took them literally. The heart cry of the nation was for the Messiah to come and set up his physical kingdom on earth. Hallelujah! <laughs> Absolutely. That. In that fact, is... in fact, you know, people always always forget this. One of the things that Jesus held most against the quote unquote spiritual leaders of their time when he came was the fact was the that fact was... that that they did not recognize the time of his coming, a literal time of his coming. They did not recognize it. Yes. Okay, Jackson, you gave applause. What was that for? No, that, that was me. It was delayed. It didn't oh, go off in time. That was Mike. What was that for? For the hallelujah. Uh, yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Oh, no, another, another public confession of those applauses not being legitimate. <laughs> I think people pretty much well, figured that. <laughs> Mike Jackson, you're wrong. Mike said he did applause. That was just the sound of him, yeah, him applauding. Just, him applaud? I don't know, remember, we're supposed to try to create the illusion it's the worldwide audience doing it. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. But isn't it wonderful? I mean, really, I, I until I read this book, I didn't really connect Isaiah and these prophecies to Revelation. And this point here is really, I mean, it is really worth a hallelujah mm -hmm. because the point is so important to understand. Isaiah said the same thing about uh, the, the this new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem as, as Revelation did, mm -hmm. and nobody says Isaiah is to be taken figuratively. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. Jackson, what's your comment on that? Um, I've always thought that, that uh, books within the Old Testament, I believe Daniel also has some prophecies, have been tied to Revelation. You know, and also, there's one, you know, the woman of the apocalypse. There, there's a, I, 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 I almost hesitate to mention this because I don't quite remember which book it's in, but there's something very similar in the Old Testament where one of the characters has a dream very similar to this. Let me just quickly see who that was. Wasn't it... Is it Joseph? Okay, while you're looking, I'll read this next part. Okay. It's worth restating that we should expect Isaiah's prophecies about the Messiah's second coming and the new earth to be literally fulfilled because his detailed prophecies regarding the Messiah's first coming were literally fulfilled. Yes. That's yes. an important point there. Yes. Are we going to say... Uh, Isaiah's figurative when when he talked about Jesus and the cross and him dying on the cross. Uh, no. it, that was figurative. No, that was literal. Yeah. Jesus, uh, to answer yeah. your question, uh, Mike was right. That was Joseph. It was Joseph's dream that's mirrored. There's this this thing called the in in Revelation chapter 12 about the woman of the apocalypse. I says I think she's dressed in the sun and stands on the moon. And this mm -hmm. this, this passage is always in a very intriguing way terrified me. I mean imagine seeing something that looks like that or whatever. But the um, 
th th this is usually uh, thought of as being symbolic for Israel due to the similarities of the dream that uh, that that Joseph had mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Genesis 37. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this uh, some of the people I've studied take this woman, this this whore of Babylon, this queen of heaven, you know, to be uh, um, this world religion, and particularly it's Roman Catholicism, and, I, and like the Pope wants to bring all religions together, and he'll head over everything, and make this uh, ecumenical, and you know, so that uh, all the religions merge into one, where he's he's the leader of it, and this is the whore of Babylon, the queen queen of heaven, Mary. Well, you've got well, well. It's important to make a distinction because there's two women talked about in Revelation. There's the the one woman who's the whore of Babylon, and there's the other who's the symbol of Israel. Says that the the, the um that the dragon was waiting to devour her child. In other words, Christ. He's ready mm -hmm. to devour him. Uh, talking about when that was going on when Christ first came. So there, there is there is a distinction between the two symbolic women in Revelation. One is the whore of Babylon, and the other one is uh, is is a symbol of Israel. Yeah, that's a, very true. And that the the woman who has the twelve twelve uh, stars, that would be Israel. Right. Uh, okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so do do you uh, think that the the whore of Babylon isn't the Catholic Church? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, uh, I think it very well may be. Uh, uh, Roman Catholicism. Uh, matter of fact, it was it was such a popular opinion uh, that uh, the uh, there was a Jesuit leader uh, many centuries ago that the Catholic Church and the Pope were thought to be this this antichrist, this false prophet, this this uh, whore of Babylon. The, many, much of Christendom was pointing to the Catholic Church as that. Yes. And therefore, the Catholic Church, the Jesuit leader, came up with this idea so that uh, to to counteract that, so th th these charges against Roman Catholicism, and they came up with this concept called preterism. They said, "No, it's already happened." That was the origination of, of preterism. Was they? Uh, it was an answer to try to get the the heat off of them. <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, one of the so that would be the the woman that rides the. The beast, right? right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, one of the theories I've heard on that is yeah, that's the Roman Catholic Church riding the beast of Islam. That's one of the interpretations I've heard on that. Say, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. That uh, that it's the Roman Catholic Church riding the beast of Islam. That's one of the theories I've heard on that matter. Uh, I don't know how Islam connects to. Yeah, it I, all. I don't. I don't think Islam connects to that. I mean, the, the what I have understood in that vision is um, the interpretation. I, some people that I've heard say, and I know it's very trivial, and people will be bothered by this, is that who the woman was that John sees. Um, there's a John makes a statement in there when he sees the woman, he marvels. And a lot of people say, well, why would he marvel when he sees her? And the symbol of the Catholic Church, a lot of people say, is really Mary, not Christ. They put more, they give more to Mary than they do even to Christ when they talk about um, redemption. Um, and they believe there are people who have put forth the theory that the woman he saw was her, and that John, when he saw her, marveled because he couldn't believe what he was seeing. And then yeah. the angel explains to him who he saw. The, the, it simply means the 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 religion, the main false religion. What I've heard the, the greatest interpretation of that was that the, the greatest religion that's going to be pushing ecumenicalism in, in that time is going to be the Catholic Church um, riding the beast, of course, the beast being Satan and Satan's system, and the church right. being the Catholic Church being on top, riding that sort of leading the push um, and that's where a lot of people believe the false prophet will probably be a pope or, or something of that nature. Mm. Mm -hmm. Hello? Jackson? Go I'm ahead. here. Go ahead. You were saying something? Yeah, the, the reason I, I uh, can possibly see how you could fit Islam in that viewpoint is because of when it specifically talks about beheadings. That's such an interesting way of execution, and it's considered a religious custom for Islam, and when there's many other ways that uh, Christians could be persecuted, like, I mean, you can go to the Holocaust, when they, how they uh, exterminated the Jewish people, why specifically beheadings? Mm-hmm. 
Well, there's a lot of interesting thing, theories on how Islam fits into all of this, and I'm not really sure about any of it. Um, but beheadings, you know, uh, that's that's not a like just strictly to Islam. You know, Paul was beheaded. Uh, beheading is considered a merciful way of execution. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul said, uh, I th thank God that uh, I was spared the jaws of the lion. Uh, instead of being thrown into the arena and eaten mm -hmm. by a lion, eaten alive, uh, because, right. he was a Roman, because he was a Roman citizen, uh, they beheaded him and it was a quick, painless death. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's another good point to be made. I just thought I'd throw that out there, not trying to venture too far off topic there. No, that's fine. Okay, uh, when Jesus spoke to his disciples before ascending to heaven, he said it was not for them to know when he would uh, restore God's kingdom on earth, but he did not say they wouldn't know if he would restore God's kingdom. After all, restoring the kingdom of God on earth was his ultimate mission. Yeah, that's a good point, uh, because, because he says... Uh, you can't know that when it doesn't. You can't infer from that that it's not going to happen. Yeah, it's going to. Yeah, we can conclude it's going to happen, but just the, but you're not going to know exactly when. The angel Gabriel promised Mary concerning Jesus, quote, "The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end." That's in Luke, Luke chapter one. David's throne is not in heaven, but on earth. It is God's reign on earth, not in heaven. That is the focus of the unfolding drama of redemption. That earthly reign will be forever established on the new earth. God has a future plan for the earth and a future plan for Jerusalem. His plan involves an actual kingdom over which he and his people will reign, not merely for a thousand years, but forever, Revelation 22. It will be the long delayed but never derailed fulfillment of God's command for mankind to exercise righteous dominion over the earth. Yeah, and that gets back to what we were saying, uh, Jackson, about, you know, who reign who's, who reign. will we reign over? Well, uh, if everybody on the earth in eternity is saved, who are we reigning over? Not each other, but we'll be reigning over the creation, as Adam and Eve did. Okay, uh, the Messiah's earthly kingdom. God's people were right to expect the Messiah to bring an earthly kingdom. That's exactly what God promised. Quote, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Psalm 72. An explicitly messianic passage tells us, quote, his rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Zechariah 9. God promises that he has a great future in store for Jerusalem in which he says, Quote, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream, Isaiah 66. Nations at peace will bring their culture treasures, uh, cultural treasures into a healed Jerusalem, precisely as Revelation 21 portrays. Well, that's where it is. I've, I've often heard this quoted, like, peace like a river, joy like a... Fountain. I, I guess this is. He uses a different translation here. Could you look up Isaiah 66:12 for me, uh, Eric? Sure. I wonder if it's peace like a river, joy like a fountain, or if that's a different one. I will extend to her, extend to her peace like a river, and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what it is. Uh, Isaiah 66, 12 says, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then shall ye suck, ye shall be born upon her sides, and be dandled upon her knee. Okay. All right. So that's what he must be saying somewhere else, like a peace like a river, a joy like a fountain. I don't... I don't know where that is, but I've always liked that. It said the flowing stream, but it didn't... It said the... Mm -hmm. Glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Every time Jewish people greet each other with shalom, they express the God-given cry of the heart to live in a world where there's no sin, suffering, or death, 
There was once such a world enjoyed by only two people and some animals, but there will again be such a world enjoyed by all its inhabitants, including everyone who knows Christ. Knows Christ. Um, let's just say, uh, how would you rephrase that, knows Christ? Because, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people who say, do you know Christ? Mm -hmm. and it, trust in Christ. Trust yeah. Christ. Yes. Those of us who put our trust in him, our faith, our dependence on him for our salvation rather than believing in ourselves. Mm -hmm. right. Isaiah 66 says that peace will come to Jerusalem and Jerusalem will become a center of all nations. Quote, I am about to come and gather all nations and tongues and they will come and see my glory as the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. All mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord, Isaiah 66. So, again, eh, you know, this is a literal kingdom on earth in eternity. This prophecy, like the others, is clearly fulfilled in the later chapters of Revelation, Jer Jerusalem will again be a center of worship because this Jerusalem will reside on the new earth. Wouldn't we expect it to be called the new Jerusalem? That's exactly what it's called. it is called in Revelation chapter 3 and chapter 21. Scriptures repeated promises about land, peace, and the centrality of Jerusalem among all cities and nations will be fulfilled. If a millennial reign on earth precedes the new earth, it could offer a foretaste. However, regardless uh, of the proper understanding of the millennium, the ultimate fulfillment of a host of Old Testament prophecies will be on the new earth where the people of God will possess the land forever. Isaiah chapter 60. All right. So uh, this... Uh, uh, this is where we'll end, uh, and we'll pick up with chapter 15 uh, uh, when we start next time. Uh, I actually was really pleasantly surprised uh, going through this study here today to see all of these rep Old Testament references to the new heaven, the new earth, and, and the new Jerusalem. Uh, someone once asked me if I uh, ever read the Old Testament. I thought, of course I've read the Old Testament. I've read the all Bible all the way through numerous times. I've read the Old Testament numerous times. I've read the New Testament many, many times. Uh, and, and yet they're asking me if I've read the Old Testament. And, and I have to admit, though, I've read the Old Testament far less than the New. And uh, it is worthwhile to, to look at the Old Testament. Once you understand the New Testament, then you can go back to the Old and it'll make more sense to you because there's a saying, when we did this study on, uh, uh, it was I think five hangouts, five shows like this, maybe four or five shows, and the title was uh, uh, Old Testament Pictures and Shadows of Jesus' Blood Atonement. So we went through all the Old Testament and showed all of the, the, the uh, pictures of the, this future blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ right. throughout the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there was a saying that was kind of the theme of the show, and that is that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think before we can understand the Old Testament, it's like, it's like uh, in that study we talked about the people who were in the play at that time didn't understand everything that was going on in the play. Uh, they were participants in it, but they didn't really understand. But we look at, we're who are observing, looking back at the Old Testament as it, as it all played out. We have the benefit of knowing the, the end of the story and now how it all fit together perfectly because we have hindsight. So, yeah, it really is helpful. To go through the, the Old Testament scriptures, and we can see how throughout the Old Testament it talks about a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, where we will have physical life on a physical earth forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so 
let's get everybody's uh, final remarks here uh, and end this show here. But uh, uh, what what stands out? Uh, let's start with Brother Mike. Mike, anything in the show today strike you as really new and that you weren't aware of or really significant? Um, I guess just a couple little things that are significant to me is the, as you said, the terminology. You mentioned the lion and the lamb. Yeah, that's been a common uh, cultural misconception that I've always thought. I, it is important to properly define how it's biblically portrayed and not what we've accepted and haven't really looked into. So that. And uh, in, in the mentions of heaven uh, er, earlier on in the in the conversation, so that's what stood out to me probably the most. Uh, yeah, uh, I think was it Jackson or you that talked about deprogramming. <laughs> well, I think I'm glad you mentioned the uh, uh, reprogramming ourselves, learning, uh, looking at our vocabulary trying to use the correct terminology so that we're, we don't get um, um, not only be guilty of falsely representing the eternity but also uh, letting giving people a misconception about what eternity is going to be because we're just used to saying it a certain way uh, yeah. I know I'm going to work at retraining myself and, and I'm going to care, more carefully choose my words when I talk about uh, you know the new heaven, the new earth, paradise, our future, our the promise we have of our eternal future. And the, just then, I tried to rephrase it in a way that that is biblically correct. Uh, how about Brother Jackson? Well, it really stood out to me how Luke is actually a microcephalic. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you know there are people out there who will say that, you know, I do have like a pea brain. You, you're aware of them, aren't you, Jackson? Yes, although that's that's actually about the brain, not necessarily head size, because some of them <laughs> yeah, actually still have a small true. brain and a large head. That's Unfortunately, true. I think some of the people saying that, that's the case. They've got a small brain and a large head. But anyway, what actually stood out to me is... Um, I really like to. Uh, I, I what, what I'm really thinking about is consistency. I think that's what a lot of this boils down to: is we need to be consistent. You know, we need to. If we say we believe the Bible, we need to actually believe it about the new earth and about the 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 way heaven is and everything. You know, we need to interpret it consistently and everything. And so that's why that that that's that's why we got into the conversation about dispensationalism and everything so in in summary go dispensationalism mm -hmm. yeah yeah and I'm glad we did discuss that dispensationalism and I I know, I know that uh, you're probably uh, one of the few people that uh, I think we agree completely on what this dispensationalism is the problem I have with it is by using the word uh, most people don't understand the term the way you and I do. Unfortunately, that's also the case with salvation, as we're talking about. Yeah, and everything. Yeah. They think yeah. it's like a sanctification, and of course, and that's about something much more important than everything. So. Yeah. Uh, I, it, well, you're right. It, 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 these words, uh, the words about dispensationalism and the words about salvation, and now we are all in the subject of today, the words about eternity. Uh, you know, uh, people have, have these wrong impressions about our state, our existence in eternity, where and, and how it will exist. Okay, how, how about Brother Eric? Um, one of the things, you know, we were kind of ending on um, is the Bible as a whole. The whole thing is the puzzle. The, the whole thing fits perfectly together. And if you separate those pieces or you try to separate them, it comes apart. You don't separate them. The whole thing perfectly fits together, and each one complements the other, the Old and the New Testament. They both complement each other perfectly, and this was demonstrated perfectly by how things are stated, how you did talking about Isaiah, and how we talked about Daniel, we talked about Ezekiel, we talked about you know, uh, you know all, the, all the prophetic books. You have to go back. If you try to take, for instance, Revelation by itself and just – go by itself, you're going to come up with all kinds of different meanings, all kinds of different things. But it's not meant to be done that way. You have to take the old prophecies 
with the revela with revelation, they all work together for, for that common goal to give you the whole picture. And if you pluck pieces out, when you do that and when you go back to those books, then it all starts fitting together and you can see the literalism of it all. Uh, today we want – there's a lot of people who want to either – Make more out of the Old Testament or more out of the New Testament? No, the two books complement each other. Okay, they, they, the the two books are the perfect message, the perfect complete message. It's the whole thing, and that was one of the big things um, um, I took away. The other thing, aside from ours, is I wanted to note uh, because I might have been a little confusing earlier. I, my brain hasn't been with me lately, but um, the we were talking about um, uh, unbelievers making it through. The tribulation and something I said, which I was wrong and I made a mistake there. What what I meant to say was unbelievers. There are unbelievers who are going to make it through the tribulation, but they're not going to go into the millennium. Like you said, the sheep and the goat separation, the judgment there, the sheep and the goats. They will not go into the millennium. Um, so you were correct, absolutely correct, in what you said about the sheep and the goats. I don't know what where I was at that point. I was thinking of something else, um, but I just wanted to correct that, make sure people out there understood I was saying the right thing and not saying something you know off the wall or something. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, I made this video. Uh, 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 let me see. Did did Jesus and Paul? Did Paul and Jesus uh, oh. teach the same message of salvation? And I started off, and I can, in forty seconds into it, I'm, I'm making the statement that uh, the, the the problem is that the message of salvation is not in the book of uh, of uh, John. I said. And I really meant to say the book of James. <laughs> right, right. I said the it was one of those call. moments. Right, it was one of those so moments. I had to call Jackson up and say, "How can I put an annotation in there to correct yeah. it so people Hello. know?" <laughs> so I was able to do that. But yeah, you know, folks, time, the people out there, folks, we're not professionals. We don't we don't do this for a living. Okay, we're we're, we're just doing this. We make mistakes. Okay, it's like give us the chance to you know. And even professionals yeah. make mistakes. Oh sure, oh absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, the only way you're going to avoid making mistakes is do nothing. Yeah, yeah, and then, then that's a mistake in and of itself. Right. Yes, that's right. That's a, the mistake of omission, right. or, um, and of neglect. Uh, the 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 more words we speak, the more times we're going to misspeak. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I want to ask. You know, we always end every show telling people, "Look, we, we're telling you about a heaven. Right? We're talking. We're telling you about how you can have this." Uh, uh, joy and bliss in a new body that never gets sick or old and dies and, and wonderful bliss and joy forever on earth, paradise on earth forever and ever. And that's, that's what's in store for, for you, but we want you to know how you can get it. So that's how we want to end every show. What good would it do to tell people how wonderful this place will be and, and they don't know what they need to do to, to have it? So we want to always make sure that we end the show that way. But first, let me let me try to do this little in like a three-part thing. I'm going to ask. Let's let's start with uh, um, uh, brother Mike, and f I want to cover basically three questions. I'm going to ask each of you. Ask one. Okay, brother Mike, could you just say and, and succinctly as you can who this Jesus Christ is, just in maybe a couple of sentences. Uh, Jesus Christ was God himself manifested in the flesh, and he lived a perfectly obedient uh, life, fulfilling the law, and he was sinless, and he, he loves you. Okay. Thank you, brother. So he is God himself who became a man, and it's perfect, sinless. Uh, brother, brother Jackson, maybe you can tell next what... Did Jesus actually do that people need to understand what he did? Well, first, he lived a completely sinless life. He never, ever did anything wrong. And in the place of us who have sinned, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, he was nailed to a cross. And he died and was buried and then rose again three, three days later. Okay. And what was accomplished through this death and this resurrection? The substitutionary atonement for our sins. Okay. The substitutionary. He, in other words, he died for our sins in our place and washes us white as snow because of it. Okay. So, uh, Brother Eric, 
uh, is everybody washed white as snow and is everybody uh, okay now because Jesus paid for all their sins? Uh, what is there something that every person who's watching this video, is there something that they must do? Now that they know who Jesus is and what he did, is there something they must do? The only thing that you must do is put your complete and total trust in what Christ did and that it was sufficient for your sins and that he was who he was and that he died on that cross for you and that there's no possible way for you to ever pay or make that payment yourself. It could only be accomplished by him and that he did that for you. And if you put that total trust in him, that's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, so I think these are three important questions. Is who is Jesus? What did he do? And what must you do? Uh, and so now the audience knows that. Uh, and uh, the, the most important thing they need to understand is they have the world basically has this false um, uh, doctrine that they can if they it, they put them their faith in their themselves. They think that if they can somehow do good enough, live a good enough life that they can satisfy God, and they have to reject that and understand that that's, that's impossible. Instead, they have to admit, admit defeat that they they cannot save themselves and they need the Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. They need to instead of relying on them, their own work, but instead rely on Jesus Christ, depend on Him, and that's when He gives them this eternal life in paradise on earth forever and ever. It's a free gift. So uh, if you're watching the show, uh, now you know who he is, what he did, and what you must do. So if you put your faith in our great Savior God, Jesus Christ, please make a comment on the video and let us know, okay? I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, talking about Jesus and the scriptures with you. Bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.